first of all, thank you for giving us the opportunity to meet you. And uh, I've been many times in Azerbaijan. Oh, really? Many, oh, yeah, yeah, many, many times. I followed even uh, the many elections. And when was the last time? The last time was a, a year and a half ago. But it came in more than 10 times. And uh, it's a very interesting country. Thank you. And I have to admit that you made some uh, very good uh, progresses from some point of view. Uh, from, and um, I am a, a Middle East correspondent in Asia from Il Sole 24 Ore, that is the biggest uh, uh, financial political newspaper yes, in Italy. I know it's, that. It's well known. So if you don't mind, during the interview, I will shift also on the relations, the strong relation between Italy and uh, your yes, country. Yes, with pleasure. And about the process of desophistication of the economy. Mm -hmm. That is a very inter interesting subject that is not reported enough or as it deserves by the international media. Mm, I agree with you. Yes, so with pleasure. I will comment on that. Mind? I would start. Yes, and please go my ahead. first question uh, is regarding the Nagorno-Karabakh issues. Mm -hmm. Yesterday you had a very interesting meeting. If I'm not wrong, it would be a, it was a face to face with the Prime Minister, exactly. Jean Michel. Yes. So, Mr. President, can you tell me how was the meeting and is there something really new we should know? Well, uh, first of all, I had a meeting with uh, President of European Council, Charles Michel. Uh, for one hour, we discussed a broad range of issues, but of course, concentrated mainly on the post-conflict situation, situation which is now um, emerged after the uh, war of the last year. And of course, the efforts of European Commission are aimed at uh, facilitating the normalization process between Azerbaijan and Armenia, and we highly value the efforts of the Commission and President Michel uh, in particular. He visited Azerbaijan and Armenia this summer, and uh, we are in permanent contact uh, after his visit, so he's aware about the details you know, of the situation, and of course we highly value his personal involvement. Uh, later in the evening we had a trilateral meeting and uh, it lasted more than four hours and was uh, I think very productive. So the both sides uh, clarified their positions once again mainly about the new realities which emerged after the Second Karabakh War, how to adjust to these realities, how to mm, learn to live as neighbors and of course, uh, we discussed the practical uh, elements of the post-war situation, particularly the opening of communications. Uh, this is an uh, important part of the trilateral statement, which was signed by President of Russia, Pr Prime Minister of Armenia, and myself last November. Uh, but the implementation of uh, this uh, important part of the statement is going very slow. So yesterday, the important decisions were made uh, about the immediate uh, uh, activity uh, by Armenia in order to start practical implementation of the railroad project. As far as we are concerned, we already started, and the railroad from uh, uh, liberated territories to Armenian border uh, must be ready by the end of 2023. And we, of course, hope that by that time, Armenia will complete their part of the homework. And of course, we uh, raised uh, other issues, uh, issues with respect to demining. And uh, President Michel expressed his willingness to help Azerbaijan to cope with this uh, situation, because after the war ended, we had almost 200 people killed or seriously injured because of the landmines. Also, we discussed uh, humanitarian issues and many others. So it was really a very productive discussion and I'm very satisfied. I just improvised <laughs> a question because you suggested me. Uh, European Union uh, just uh, announced a package of uh, almost uh, $2 billion to Armenia, close to $2 billion to Ukraine. 
but only, if I'm not wrong, 140 million euros towards <laughs> Azerbaijan. Yes. I mean, uh, it's a very big difference. And why? What do you think is that the basis of this decision? Well, it's difficult to say why, because in order to answer this question, I must have uh, enough uh, facts. I can only have my mm, opinion about that. And uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is uh, something which is a matter which surprised many observers and, of course, was a very unpleasant surprise for Azerbaijani population. Just want to uh, clarify that the package to Armenia announced by European Commission is $2.6 billion. And to Azerbaijan, as you mentioned, 140. So the difference is almost 20 times. Is it fair? No. Is it based on the real demands of both countries? Of course, no. Even if we put aside the terrible devastation uh, which uh, Armenia uh, created and did on the liberated territories, just if you take the number of people who live in both countries, you will see its difference is five times, 10 million against two in Armenia. Uh, plus, uh, during the years of occupation, uh, the territory equal to uh, the territory of Lebanon was totally destroyed, demolished. And now foreigners and journalists and uh, visitors visit those areas and see with their own eyes the level of demolition. Uh, plus, uh, according to our estimations, um, there are close to one million uh, mines planted and the demining is very costly yeah. and takes a lot of time. Uh, in Armenia, uh, nothing is destroyed. This country was not occupied. It was a country which occupied. And the economy of Armenia uh, physically cannot absorb this huge package. So um, it's very uh, surprising. And after it was announced, uh, starting from this summer when President Michel visited Azerbaijan, uh, we permanently discussed this issue and we want a um, single standard approach. We want uh, justice and, uh, of course, we ask for the same terms and conditions and for the same amount to Azerbaijan. Yes, President, you are definitely right because the mining is a very sensitive and important and strategical activity. If you really uh, want to uh, let people at Zeri come back to the occupied, liberated territories uh, to live, to settle, you have to guarantee the safety of these places. And uh, so I was surprised. But uh, why are you not surprised that uh, such a delicate issues of the mining, uh, a war, a <laughs> area, has not, uh, has not pushed the European uh, Union to act uh, earlier? I don't know. I raised many times these issues um, and um, also yesterday during the meeting with uh, President Michel, I even suggested um, the European Commission to look at the opportunity to finance uh, from their funds the mining in Azerbaijan. I said, okay, don't give the money to us provide financial support to European companies which are involved in the mining and uh, uh, let them come to Azerbaijan and to start this work because physically it's not possible for Azerbaijan to do it in a short period of time. Plus, it is very costly and you're absolutely right. Without the mining, we cannot uh, bring people back. They've been waiting for that for almost 30 years. Now the huge reconstruction started but uh, the areas which are being uh, under reconstruction are demined, but the rest part is not. So people who will go back, they will face uh, serious problems and threat to their lives. So I hope that uh, after these communications, there'll be more clarity about that. But of course, our needs are not limited only by demining. Uh, everything is destroyed. There is no cities, no villages, nothing. There's destroyed territory and our position is that uh, the level of support, whether it's uh, financial donations or uh, loans 
to Armenia and to Azerbaijan must be at the same, same level. But don't you think that uh, this is my suggestion that the European Union is more prudent because of the some reports, according to some reports, there are still some problems of uh, uh, human rights or problem of press freedom in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan has improved by far since it started. Everybody knows that this process takes time, but maybe this cannot be something that is lowering this uh, No, kind I of don't activity. think so, first of all, because now there are more understanding in European institutions that this uh, uh, perception about uh, problems with human rights and media freedom are exaggerated. Because in Azerbaijan there is no restrictions on media. We have free internet, no censorship, and we have now more than 80% of Azerbaijani population are internet users. And <laughs> you cannot uh, restrict media and have free, uh, free internet. The same with uh, human rights issues. All the human rights are protected and uh, Azerbaijan is not facing uh, the criticism it faced many years ago because first we managed to persuade our European partners that uh, their information mainly was based on wrong uh, scenario and second we implemented a large scale of political and economic reforms. And second if you look to the substance you will see that in Armenia, the human rights and political uh, freedoms are brutally violated. Just as an example, many representatives of political parties are in prison. There are criminal cases against leaders of main uh, political parties. There is a huge uh, public discontent with respect to repressions in Armenia. And these are all facts which are absolutely clear. But um, Armenia has a kind of a permanent uh, umbrella, no matter what happens there, it is considered to be a democracy. <laughs> so it's a kind of a double standards again. Suggested, sorry, another question because I can be very direct, but yes, yes, sure. in, a, in a few months you have uh, retaken uh, the districts, uh, the district that have been uh, taken by uh, Armenian forces during the first war. And uh, in 15 years, almost 15 years of negotiations, <laughs> you didn't receive that result. <laughs> so my question is, uh, the Minsk group seemed before to be oriented, not officially, uh, toward a status quo, just to keep uh, an armed peace. <laughs> that is, and this is uh, useful maybe even for Russia that can, can play a role until things uh, are in this way. So what is your opinion about the role of Minsk Group? Because you yourself, but other um, uh, Zegar authorities have been rather skeptical, if not disappointed, yes. to work this group. Yes, first of all I'd like to say that the Minsk Group uh, was obliged to resolve the conflict by a mandate uh, from OSC since 1992. So they uh, were in function for 28 years until last November when we in 44 days liberated the territories. My opinion about the Minsk group uh, activity does not differ from the opinion of the Azerbaijani people. It's, uh, it's a failure. We must tell the truth. We should not uh, uh, pretend to be politically correct when it's, it's clear like a daylight. If uh, the Minsk Group co-chairs, which are the leading countries of the world, three out of five permanent members of Security Council, three nuclear powers, the most powerful countries of the world, could not or did not want to uh, put an end to Armenian occupation, that means that the activity was failure. They worked for 28 years, can you imagine? I was just sorry for interrupting <laughs> you, just uh, start from the Madrid principles, <laughs> but okay, yes, it's, yes. it's a longer, longer time yeah, for the next Yeah, Madrid principles was more than 10 years ago, yeah. but they started in 92, yeah. and the uh, three leading uh, countries which I mentioned uh, became the co-chairs several years later. For well, anyway, it's more than 20 years, but without zero result. And why? 
Probably because, as you said, the status quo was acceptable to them. Though I can tell you that at certain stages, uh, even on the level of the heads of states, of the co-chairs of the Minsk group, there have been positive statements that status quo is unacceptable and must be changed. And we were very encouraged by that. But unfortunately, there were no actions. And it was very simple. And uh, I um, raised this issue many times. To persuade Armenia or to force Armenia to leave the territories of Azerbaijan and to comply with United Nations Security Council resolutions demanding that, the only way to do it was to impose sanctions on Armenia. Uh, we know that in certain cases these sanctions are being imposed on other countries, but not on Armenia. Again, double standards, again, um, unjust approach. And Azerbaijani people were uh, tired of these uh, permanent visits of this Minsk Group Troika. Several times a year they were coming and going without any result. And actually, uh, their activity was. Um, totally paralyzed after 2019, when Armenian Prime Minister declared that Karabakh is Armenia. And that meant that <laughs> it's end of negotiations. Because if Armenia says that Karabakh is Armenia, what to negotiate about? Another thing is that uh, later Armenian leadership said that Karabakh is an independent country, which was contradictory to the previous statement. But Minsk Group did not react. They did not even uh, condemn this statement. And of course, this kind of um, behavior only encouraged Armenia to strengthen their uh, position on the table and to make occupation endless. That was a target of Armenia, and unfortunately, Minsk Group helped them in that. Thank you, President. Let's shift uh, to the region especially um, the problem with between uh, Europe uh, and Russia. It's not your, <laughs> your business, but Azerbaijan could help Europe. <laughs> because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, European Union fears that a possible uh, invasion, Russian invasion of Ukraine, could uh, uh, create uh, tensions so high that uh, some project would be uh, delayed or even that Russia could use uh, weapon, uh, uh, the gas, sorry, the natural gas as a weapon. I mean, uh, European Union is desperately uh, looking uh, to diversify its uh, supplying routes. And uh, as a matter of fact, the South Corridor appears to be one of the most interesting uh, uh, channels in the future. You have a lot of gas, with your uh, interesting program to, to implement the uh, green energies. You will have even more gas to export. You have a line, you can even double the line, and, uh, which finish with the TAP, but you can also, from Greece, go to the Balkans. So, should European Union ask you to help and provide more natural gas? Would be you will be ready to, to satisfy this request as soon as you can? Well, of course, uh, our uh, gas uh, strategy was uh, very clear and open, and for many years we did a lot uh, in Azerbaijan and working with the partners in order to build this important project, which is uh, mm, considered to be one of the biggest infrastructure projects in 21st century, the Southern Gas Corridor, 3,500 kilometers from Baku to Italy, going on the Adriatic Sea, uh, going through the high mountains. It's a very complicated project from technical point of view, and of course very costly. And Azerbaijan, uh, I would say, took uh, the main financial burden in all the four segments of the uh, Southern Gas Corridor. And uh, prior to the completion, or the full completion of the project, last uh, December, we already signed contracts with consumers. And our gas was contracted. And during this uh, so-called gas crisis with a price, problem with the price, our consumers did not uh, feel any changes. Uh, if uh, we talk about our future plans, of course, there is a possibility to increase the output and to increase 
the exports, but that will depend, of course, on the demand from European consumers. European Commission uh, was uh, assisting us in that process. We regularly convene in Baku the Advisory Council of the Southern Gas Corridor, which is chaired by uh, representatives of European Union and Azerbaijan. And the next uh, session will take place next February, where we address uh, all the issues and plan our future steps. It's a big group of uh, companies, banks and countries. Now the team is growing because uh, we became already suppliers to Europe. Uh, starting from uh, 1st January, we supplied 7.2 billion cubic meters of gas to Italy, Greece and Bulgaria. Next year it will be 9, 2023 it will be at least 11. So it's a serious increase. But in order to increase uh, the production, we need of course to invest. And in order to do that, we need to have contracts with consumers. So the contracts first, investment second, and gas third. This is the stages of the process. But we are ready, as you said, we have huge deposits, brand new modern infrastructure with potential uh, interconnectors to other destinations in Europe. You mentioned Balkans and also I would add the Central Europe. And uh, that will be diversification of supplies for us and diversification for consumers. Yes. and. Uh Let's suppose that everything is going in the right direction and you will uh, increase by far the production and the export toward Europe. Don't you fear the reaction of, of Russia? Because Russia is a very important economic partner of yours. It's also a massive power in the region and uh, it's uh, a dead effect that it ex exports much, much, much more gas than yours, but it could be a symbolic move. Don't you fear the reaction of Russia? No, not at all. First of all, this issue has never been uh, discussed uh, on the high level between uh, leaders of the countries. All our energy projects, starting from oil pipeline to gas pipeline, were completed in a very friendly environment in the region. This is first thing. And second, uh, uh, Russia fully respects uh, our policy, our foreign policy, our energy policy, and uh, we are not rivals. Uh, and as I said many times, uh, this issue is sometimes artificially uh, exaggerated. We are in no way competitors to Russia because uh, Russia is supplying hundreds of billions of cubic meters to Europe and demand for Russian gas is growing. Azerbaijan just started. And as I said, our supply to Europe will be 11 billion in 2023. And it can stay like that if we don't have new contracts and if we don't invest uh, in new production. Therefore, uh, in no way this could uh, play any negative role in our relations with Russia, which are very positive and well balanced. Let's move on to the economy. Uh, your country suffer from a certain dependence of energy export, oil and natural gas, essentially. Now, the process of economic diversification, uh, I think, is a priority for you today. Up to now, this process appears to be very slow, to, to be honest. From. But uh, how do you intend to accelerate and implement it? Uh, what are you aiming for to carry it forward? With respect to our, the structure of our economy, I think we manage already significantly to reduce the volume of oil and gas in our GDP, which uh, many years ago was absolute majority and now is less than half. So the structure of Azerbaijan's economy became more balanced. But with respect to our exports, of course, uh, more than 90% of our export is oil, natural gas, oil products and electric energy. For the country, it is an advantage because uh, we managed to uh, enter the markets. We're exporting now oil, natural gas, electric energy, petrochemicals and oil products, which uh, brings uh, a lot of uh, cash flow to our economy. And the more uh, gas we export, and the growing numbers of gas is obvious, the less is ratio in our export of non-oil products. For gas and oil, uh, we don't need to look for markets. Oil is on the world market, gas already has markets, 
But for our other products, like agricultural products, we are uh, limited with uh, regional markets. And uh, it's very difficult to enter European market because European market itself is competing the countries between <laughs> themselves. So our main exports uh, are Turkey, Russia, and um, some other countries. Uh, I would say that uh, this year was uh, very remarkable from that point of view. Our export of non-energy uh, projects grew 45%, and our non-energy uh, related industry grew 20%. So it's really a remarkable result. Still, in the uh, volume of exports, the ratio of non-oil segment is low, but I think it will grow, especially taking into account the new opportunities on the liberated territories and with huge potential of uh, agriculture, tourism, renewable energy, and uh, industry. So we plan uh, reduce dependence on uh, oil and gas in the future. Uh, but at the same time, we should understand that uh, oil and gas will play an important role for our economy for many decades ahead. Yes, but um, uh, um, let's move to Italy because uh, uh, Italy is very interested in Azerbaijan. Italy was uh, Azerbaijan's first trading partner. Uh, Rome and Baku have in a very good, uh, uh, got very good relations. Uh, in addition to natural gas, Azerbaijan is also uh, um, a leading supplier, as I told you, of oil. Um, there are, are there opportunities for Italian companies in the process of Azeg diversifying the economy? For instance, in the, you, know, you, you, you told that maybe you intend to rebuild the liberated areas, so there are a lot of things, projects to do, even on uh, green resources. Definitely. Italy is one of our closest partners, not only on the European continent, but globally. Our relations, I think, are now on a very high level. And the indicator to that is the fact that we signed a document on strategic partnership. Italy is one of the nine member states of EU with whom Azerbaijan signed a strategic partnership document. And uh, there have been high level visits of the presidents and uh, other officials. And uh, as you said, uh, Italy for us is the main trading partner. And now after the Trans-Adriatic pipeline is in operation, Azerbaijan become an important supplier uh, to Italy and the uh, volume of Azerbaijani gas in Italian consumption will grow year after year. At the same time, as a friendly country, Italy was among the first countries uh, which we invited to work uh, on liberated territories. The first was Turkey, the second was Italy. And I can tell you that now there are a lot of projects which Italian companies are implementing there. We uh, invited Italian uh, architects to uh, renovate our historical monuments and mosques in Shusha. And this is a very symbolic gesture because Shusha is a sacred place for us. It's a um, cultural capital of Azerbaijan. And um, the uh, religious site is a sacred for everyone. So. It's a very high level of trust. And just uh, recently, when I was visiting Shusha, I met Italian representatives who demonstrated me how they're planning to continue. Italian company is now in the active process of the construction of the Victory Museum in Baku. It's another symbolic gesture because you can imagine uh, this historical victory it means uh, a lot to us. And uh, we invited Italian company uh, deliberately to demonstrate our partnership and knowing the high level of performance, high level of taste, and the friendly relations between us. And I can name you many other construction projects uh, in uh, liberated territories and in the uh, other parts of Azerbaijan where Italian companies are very active. I can uh, tell you that during the visit of President uh, Mattarella to Azerbaijan, we together inaugurated the petrochemical plant, which was built by Italian companies. And now the same company is actively working on reconstruction of our refinery. It's a multi-billion project. It's industry, petrochemicals, construction, architecture, renovation. So the broad range of issues. So uh, once again, this is a demonstration of our friendship 
and our partnership. Thank you. May I allow myself for a last question? Yes, of course. Yeah, because about, uh, it was interesting, the economic uh, issue in Azerbaijan, because it's a developed country. So, mm, Azerbaijan occupies a strategic, very important strategic position in the world, in, the, uh, in the Asia. And it could become not only a, a, an energy hub, but also a sort of a commercial hub, a transportation hub uh, between West and East, from China to, to Europe. Uh, apart. This could be also a, a, a way of diversifying the economy, provide there is stability in a, in a region. And then at the same time, it could be helpful for stabilize and uh, reach peace. Can you just tell me something? Uh, what do you think? I fully agree with your assessment and this is actually um, what we are doing in Azerbaijan for the last, um, at least actively doing for the last decade, transforming Azerbaijan into a Eurasia's uh, transportation hub. It's not an easy task because we do not have access to open seas. We need to have uh, good relations, first of all, with our neighbors, because without having these relations, no country can become a transit country. Uh, therefore, uh, good regional uh, cooperation environment plus investments in uh, transportation infrastructure created this opportunity. But it was not easy because we had to invest a lot. And today, for instance, in Azerbaijan, we have six international airports and three international airports on the liberated territories. One already inaugurated, two more to come. We have a diversified uh, railroad system which connects us to all the neighbors. We have uh, modern highways. Mm, and by the way, Davos Forum ranked Azerbaijan number 27 with respect to the quality of the roads. And number uh, 11 and 12 with respect to air services and railroad services. So this already is uh, happening. We already became a transitor for goods from Central Asia, China also is transporting its goods to uh, European destination. Plus, another advantage is Azerbaijan is situated on the north-south transportation corridor, which goes from northern Europe, Russia, Azerbaijan, Iran, and further down to Persian Gulf. And uh, all the construction work, whether it's railroad or highway, on Azerbaijani segment of the north-south have been already completed. And of course, uh, uh, after the Second Karabakh War, uh, there are opportunity to open a new corridor, which is already called everywhere as Zangezur Corridor, which goes from Azerbaijan to Armenia, and then to Azerbaijan's Nakhchivan Autonomous Republic, further down to Turkey and Europe, which will be an alternative uh, route for transportation. Plus, we are actively working on creation of the free zone close to Baku in the uh, Alat district, which uh, will be in operation uh, next year. And we hope that this geographic location, already diversified transportation network, will help us to attract investors who would prefer to work there. So transportation sector will uh, become uh, one of the leading after energy sector. And uh, investment in this uh, component, of course, is brings a lot of benefits. Plus, I would add uh, the inauguration of the, the biggest on the Caspian shore uh, trade seaport, uh, which uh, capacity can go up to 25 million tons. And construction of the shipyard, we already supply ourselves with all kinds of cargoes, tankers, and ferry boats. So this is really a big asset. Plus, as you mentioned, uh, stability in Azerbaijan, reliability, because we never disrupt any contract and violate even a word in any contract. So our partners trust us and good relations with all our neighbors. Plus, we hope that relations with Armenia also will be normalized, as we discussed yesterday. Uh, with Prime Minister Pashinyan and President Michel, and then Armenia also will have a chance to become part of the regional transportation network because now it's deadlocked. It doesn't have railroad connection with Russia, it will have. It doesn't have connection with Iran railroad, it will have through Azerbaijan.
and Azerbaijan through Armenia will go to its autonomous republic, Nakhchivan. It's a win-win situation. I think um, understanding of this uh, golden opportunity is really must come in Armenia so that they behave in a more, uh, to say, active way and do not hesitate to engage with us in these uh, future uh, plans. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you.